Uh, we'd like to uh, welcome you to the Ash Center and to this uh, special presentation on uh, Bob Bain's uh, work on the performance stat potential and uh, Joe Curtitoni, Mayor of Somerville's efforts uh, to improve the quality of life in uh, his city, uh, which is, best I can tell, had a great success and uh, owes uh, no small amount to his efforts to uh, use data and performance measurement systems to improve the performance of the city. Um, so. You will have noticed uh, that I'm not uh, Tony Sage. Um, I regret that for many notice. reasons. Um, <laughs> uh, I think it would be great to be Tony Sage and to speak Chinese and to uh, head the Ash Center and stuff like that, but I'm not he, and so I, I'm uh, simply Mark Moore. Uh, and um, I've studied public management here at the school, and Tony has to be at a faculty meeting, uh, so he asked me if I would take the responsibility of convening this session and uh, monitoring uh, the panel discussion, which I was delighted to do. And the principal reason I'm delighted to do it is that one of the really fun things about being in the Ash Center is that it is a place where uh, we take um, uh, practical questions of government and performance very seriously, uh, and we can distinguish kind of innovation that is on display here, which is an innovation in the design of a performance measurement system that would cause the performance and learning of the city to go up, uh, and therefore would be something that would increase uh, the total number of innovations in the city, uh, partly uh, as a secondary result. So you have an innovation at the administrative level that produces innovation at the operational level uh, due to the way the system uh, tends to motivate and drive performance of the city by the organization. So our schedule for today is for Bob to uh, step forward and uh, lay out uh, sort of the basic thesis of his book, and then for Mayor Curtis Tony to comment on uh, his efforts to improve the performance of city government uh, and the way in which uh, the use of information systems has helped or harmed that effort. So uh, Bob, uh, I should, as Bob, steps up here. This is my colleague Bob Bain, he's a professor here at the Kennedy School of Government. He's been my friend and colleague for over 30 years. So Okay, so the title of the book is The Performance Stat Potential, a Leadership Strategy for Producing Results. It all starts in New York City with Comstat. Here is a picture of the Comstat room, the old Comstat room. Uh, over here is a precinct commander uh, standing at the podium, and down here is the uh, leadership of the department. Um, here is a picture of uh, William Bratton, the uh, then police commissioner of New York. A little history here. Um, Rudy Giuliani gets elected mayor in November of 73. Um, 93, right, sorry, 93. Um, I couldn't decide whether it was the echo or what. Um, 93. And um, he campaigns on getting crime down in New York City. Bill Bratton becomes commissioner in January of 94. By early 96, crime is down across the country, but down significantly in New York. And Time Magazine is going to feature this. Mayor Giuliani says, ooh, cool. My picture is going to be on the cover of Time Magazine. And within three months, Bill Bratton is the former police commissioner of New York. Uh, here is Jack Maple on the set of a TV program called The District, which uh, preceded The Wire. How many of you have seen The Wire? How many have this impression of Comstat from The Wire? Okay. Um, this was a previous program. Um, Greg Nelson, the actor, was the uh, police commissioner. 
uh, Jack Maple, the um, cop behind um, Comstat in New York, uh, was a consultant. And this is an example of art imitating life. That is, Maple started wearing the shoes, and the actor copied them. Um, the Comstat strategy spread all across the U.S. Almost every senior, um, every, every large police department uses it. It uh, is also used throughout Australia, where um, the policing is done by the states, not by the municipalities. Um, it next spread within New York City. A variety of non-policing um, organizations implemented the strategy. Here I mentioned two. Um, HRA was doing job stat for its welfare uh, programs and administration for children's services was doing child stat. Spread to agencies elsewhere. Here are two from Los Angeles County. Um, the uh, social service agency had something called DPSS stat. Um, mental health, um, mental health uh, just called it stat. Um, the interesting thing is that New York and L.A. did not know about each other until we brought uh, representatives from both of them to the Kennedy School. Um, the next was a spread to uh, jurisdictions. Baltimore was the first, but <coughs> Joe, right after um, he became mayor, um, went to Baltimore and set up uh, Somerset and Somerville. And then the last thing I will just emphasize is that um, the feds with the Government Performance and Results Act, Modernization Act of 2010, um, required every um, federal agency to run quarterly performance reviews. The three examples I put up here, FDA, TRAC, FEMA STAT, and HUDSTAT, were agencies that started doing it before um, Congress decided to tell them to do it. Okay, so what is it? Um, this is what took me 10 years to try to figure out. And I came up with this very long-winded definition, in part because I wanted to emphasize different things. First thing I want to emphasize is it's a leadership strategy. Uh, it isn't just the data. You have to have the organization's leadership actively engaged in doing it, pursuing specific public purposes by producing specific results using current data, not last year's data, to analyze our recent performance, um, holding regular, frequent, integrated meetings at which people get feedback about how they're doing against their targets. Um, there's a follow-up that gets reflected from what happened at the previous meeting. And despite what you saw on the wire, there is a more effort to learn from these um, efforts than to beat up on the um, incompetence. Um, trying to figure out what the next performance deficits we should focus our attention on, setting new targets, and lastly, I just want to emphasize that you have to be persistent. So I'm just going to end it here. Um, the definition covers most of the things I think um, Joe's going to talk about, but also the questions that you will have. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm introduce uh, Joe Curtitone, the mayor of Somerville, well known to Kennedy School uh, audiences. He's becoming regular here. Uh, <laughs> we're very glad to. And I believe you're also uh, teaching a course uh, this uh, semester uh, with our colleague Dora De Young, who's just appeared. Right Absolutely. So we're very glad to have you here. Well, thank you. Well, it's great to be here. <clears throat> I actually have an office, you know, believe it or not, down the hallway. <laughs> Put my coat in there. Um, but it's great to be here, and uh, Mark and um, with uh, Professor Bain, who's really been the expert or the stat guru, or the only one really to compile any work or research on it that I found anywhere. Um, I became mayor in 2003. Uh, prior to that, I served on the board of Alderman which is the legislative body in the city of Somerville. And I had learned about what Baltimore was doing and my frequent visits here to the Kennedy School. I used to come over to the Rappaport Institute and uh, it was part of an effort to improve uh, lo uh, leadership and governance at the local municipal level here in the greater Boston area. And I was exposed to that. And um, when 
I became mayor, one of the platforms I campaigned on, or part of the platform, was on performance management, delivering results and adopting or emulating the best practices of the private and public sector. And I, I said we'd bring city stat. I had a brochure, we're going to bring city stat and 311 city stat to Somerville. And you know, most people looked at, well, what is that? You know, but uh, the concept of managing and delivering results uh, people could relate to, and there was a value statement in that. So I, and you know, immediately become, upon uh, being elected, I worked with people at the Kennedy School and to be, get connected with then Mayor O'Malley Martin O'Malley, who was a great mentor to me in establishing um, the staff program. We also had fellows from the school that really were the lead people working on the ground uh, in Somerville. And some were, uh, who volunteered also were part of then Mayor O'Malley's team uh, in Somerville, um, uh, in, in Baltimore. But I'll tell you, for Somerville, it's been a transformation. It was about a change of culture um, from trying to manage within the four corners of the <coughs> item budget and just and I'd say manage from a perspective of an approach of cost containment than understanding how, you know, what the data really is telling us. You know, uh, what are the variables driving outcomes? Um, you know, are there any metrics to the money we're spending? Are we tied to any goals, objectives, or values of the community? Uh, and there was nothing probative about how we delivered services in Somerville. So I was chair of the finance committee of the Board of Aldermen, the legislative body where I served for eight years. And the only information we had is if you came up and uh, if you were the Department of Public Works head and or, or if you were in traffic and parking, you usually came to us because you needed something at budget time, uh, some capital investment, or something was wrong. Um, and the only thing in a typical line item budget without any data, real-time data to gauge how we're spending money is basically just basically tells you the amount of money we spent. And if you came before the Board of Alderman Finance Committee, where I chaired, and served for many years, and you had any money left on your budget, you could bet during budget time, we, we would just cut it. And we did so without any reason or logic. We just assumed, no, you just didn't need the money. So your default was to make sure we spend down before we get to the Board of Aldermen. So, it, and it, we were basically trying, to, we were driving a car blindfolded from the budgeting, um, delivery of services, operations, and performance standpoint of the city. Um, so when we came, I became mayor, we wanted to change that dynamic. We wanted to change the culture, how we manage the city's budget. We wanted to embrace the utilization of data on a real-time basis to hold ourselves accountable, to be more transparent, to allocate resources to programs that work, and the programs weren't worth the taxpayer's investment, to not fund those, res those programs, reallocate those resources to areas of greater need, and to unlock opportunity. Now, I, I pride on what uh, some of all, uh, I'm very proud of some of what we, and how we utilize Summerstat. Uh, and I think some of the points in Bob Bain's book are critical. I mean, this has to come from the top of the organization. This is not just some subsidiary department head in the city of Somerville. This speaks and comes directly out of the CEO, the mayor's office. My Summerstat team, my director speaks for me. Um, you know, I was in a meeting today I had two meetings this morning, and uh, you know if, whether I'm there or not, they know I'm there. Uh, and if I'm not there, I'm updating all the statistics, all the trends, and evolution <coughs> of data that we're seeing in our operations, uh, performance, and issues that, ar ar that arise on a on a daily basis, on a real time basis. But by address by utilizing data on a real time basis, and mining data from every source possible, because we believe in Summerville, no data is too redundant. And there'll be some will push back and say, well, you start thinking only about the data. So no, no data is too redundant. So we'll measure everything. We take information from um, department heads directly. We'll use financial information. We'll take information from our 311 uh, constituent service line. Uh, we'll measure everything and anything and that's in some of it. We will even measure your subjective happiness to understand that <laughs> what we perceive to be true is actually true from you where you stand. So for us, embracing data on a real-time basis, um, being probative of that data, testing it. So if our outcomes exceeded our expectation, we want to know why. If our outcomes certainly did not meet expectation, we certainly want to know why. And asking why, like a curious child, uh, it, it never becomes stale. We are always asking why. And what are the variables driving any particular outcome? And I think that's what's really um, unique about what we do in Somerville. And What's great about Bob's book is it'll give you certainly a flavor of what is happening 
with staffing around the different communities, regions, agencies, different levels of government who have utilized that. Uh, we believe in mining data from every different source possible. Uh, we believe in being probative and all that data. We believe in um, not being become static with the data. That's important. Um, so we have allowed the data to take us to every div every possible or every wherever it takes us on and for from an operational uh, efficiency or an innovation standpoint to unlock opportunities for new policies or program or legislative interventions. Um, we are utilizing data not just to manage the basic operations of the city, but everything from economic development to new housing <coughs> initiatives to measuring our transportation and mobility plans for the city. Um, it has been an unbelievable uh, process and evolution for us that has really allowed Somerville to prosper. Now this is important because we are not a rich city. We spend, um, in terms of per capita, near the bottom of the state uh, compared to any city or town. We used to be at the very bottom. We're probably in the, in the bottom six out of communities in the Commonwealth. Cambridge and Boston spend twice as more per capita than we do. Um, so we believe in the notion, I think everyone agreed, that we have to use taxpayer dollars wisely. We have to be accountable for how we use it. In a community like Somerville, which was so heavily dependent in the past, still somewhat on money that we aid that we get from the state, and when, as that aid has shrunk over time, we have to be very surgical and strategic in making sure we're getting the most return for that money. And the data speaks loudly. The data is powerful. It affirms how we're spending our taxpayer dollars. It gains and earns trust and respect from the legislative body that has to be an important partner in major investment decisions for the city. The bond rating agencies that looked and specifically at this management tool for the city of Somerville, and we've had, I think, two or three bond rating increases in the last 10 years. We're one step below AAA for the city, which would be a historic milestone. Uh, but it's really important to remember a few points, and this is all spelled out in Bob Bain's book. This is not, I'm not a financial manager. I'm not even an analyst. But the people you need to crunch these numbers have to be of a specific skill set. And you really need analysts to crunch these numbers. Without the individuals to analyze and take a look at the data and analyze in a particular way, it just becomes an abstract set of numbers. Uh, your basic uh, people in your finance department aren't going to be able to do this. Uh, really, the data is very powerful and really guides everything we do in Somerville. The finance department does not. But aligning the <coughs> metrics and the data on a real-time basis with our financial goals and community goals is critical. Um, the statting model in terms of being around the table with our cabinet, our, our summer stat cabinet, and, uh, and for the rank and file who participate in those meetings is more, some, most of the time the only interaction I get to have with that individual. And people get to talk about how they've performed, met expectations, or explain why they haven't, or why an investment in a particular program or capital investment may allow us to have greater outcomes in the future. So statting is, as Bob said, it's not about having a punitive tribunal where a department head uh, gets, to get, gets beat up by your executive, but it is an area where we ha have to be accountable because we own that data. As we tell our department heads in DPW or in traffic and parking or in the mayor's office, that department has your name on it, that's your data. And we have to be probative and ask why the outcomes are what they are and try to mine and dig down to what the variables are driving them. But for some of all, for a city that's really a small size city with not a lot of resources, it's allowed us to deliver greater, serv better services to our constituents to show why we're doing it, to gain greater, uh, greater trust, to have better outcomes, to improve our financial picture, and really unlock innovative opportunities. Because it, it really is an opportunity to enable collaborative creativity in a setting utilizing data. So we've gone from measuring potholes and graffiti, again, to measuring happiness, happiness, to measuring the systems outlining the ecosystem of a city. We'll be the first city in the world that does that because uh, that data really helps spell out how our policy impacts systems around public health, public transportation, education, and how those systems collide to create environments to create environments to influence behavior and outcomes. And that really starts from having the data at your fingertips. So I, I can't say enough of what the summer stat management approach, performance approach, I should say, has meant to the community, how it continues to build, how it continues to evolve, and what I, I really appreciate the work that Bob Baines put together, because I really had no book to go to. 
when I was a man. <laughs> I was just curious. I heard about this thing. It made all the sense in the world. And what's important, when you, when you align a passion for curiosity with the power of data on a real-time basis, it can take you to so many different places. And that's what it has done for some of them. And Bob Bain's book is, as I pointed to for many of my colleagues in government, a great, a great place to not just start, to learn and to thrive and understand how this really common sense management approach can pay great dividends for a community or institution or agency. I appreciate it. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, I wasn't going to do this, but uh, maybe we could start, uh, and I could assume the responsibility of opening the conversation by asking three uh, different questions that could generate a little bit of discussion between Bob and Joe. All right. So, the first question has to do with the claim uh, that both Bob and Joe made. Incidentally, Bob, can we put the slide with all the substance yep, on it? Yep, yep. We don't want to sell the book. We want to sell the ideas, you know. <laughs> How else are you going to get the ideas? And all those little red things would be really good. Uh, they, they only, they only, they only show up one at a time. time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so both of you began with the idea that <coughs> this had to be come from the top, it had to be sustained, it had to be, um, uh, it had to involve a long-term commitment. And all those things, I assume, are associated with the expectation that you had to create a change in the culture of the organization, right? Or the culture of the jurisdiction. And that one part of that change in the culture was to accept the idea of a more rigorous kind of accountability than people had faced up to that time. And then also to uh, be accustomed to the idea that uh, data uh, in the form of statistics would be used for the evaluation of the performance of the government and them individually, right? So now, in many private sector firms, you don't have to win that cultural battle. That uh, cultural battle was fought out a long time ago, and everybody comes into the firm knowing that they're going to be called to account for bottom line performance, and that's the way things work, right? So the question I'm asking is, um, what was it that allowed you to drive the uh, shift the culture from one that was focused on uh, non-accountability and non-data to one that said, okay, we'll accept the idea that our lives and futures could be guided by uh, an accountability system that paid attention to the numbers. You can start. Yeah. So um, for me, I was a new mayor elected, and the, uh, we had just come off, uh, that would have been the end of fis the middle of fiscal year 2004, um, and we had just absorbed a couple of mid-year budget cuts um, from them Governor Romney. And at that point in time, in 2002, it was considered in Massachusetts the high watermark or the high mark of state aid. In Massachusetts, municipalities get their money from three areas. The property tax, whenever you're paying a a fine or a fee in some of them, that money goes to a good cause, uh, <laughs> and, and the growth and state aid. More than 10 years ago, 40% of our revenues come from state aid, came from state aid. Today, it's probably 20 or less, less than 20. We absorbed incredible deep cuts as well as every community in Massachusetts. In fact, today, I think we receive in today's dollars more than $40 million per year less than we did uh, back then. When you have no backbone of metrics to measure how you're spending money, um, and we again, I, I use the analogy or the, or the metaphor, we're driving a, a car, dry, a blindfold. We, our spending wasn't tied to any goals and objectives, any value, any metrics. It's, it, it, your, your deficiencies become glaringly obvious when you take a, tw a major cut in state aid, and we took a huge cut. So there was a crisis. We couldn't deliver basic services. We couldn't explain to the public why one service or program should be prioritized or another, or why we were just making the cuts that we were making. Again, we were trying to cut our way to success, and you know the adage, you can't manage what you don't measure. So that allowed me, that disequilibrium <laughs> in the public, and the legislative body, and the decision makers, allowed me great leeway to put forth great reforms. So when I campaigned on bringing city staff to some level, you know, not everybody knew what it was, but they were sure as hell interested. You know, could this really, you know, it was about changing the culture and the mindset of the public, of the legislative bodies, of all the decision makers, and of the people we were hiring that we're going to do business different. Right. Could I just ask a couple of follow-up questions on that? So one idea there is that a crisis uh, helps, and a, a certain amount of external political pressure forms. <coughs> 
And in this case, the improved performance though was focused on uh, managing with lower cost, right? Uh, and presumably, if we're managing with lower cost, output is gonna go down. So then there's two things that can happen. One is that we could get, we could work harder, or we could work smarter, or we could lose some of the output, right? And uh, is it your claim that Somerset actually allowed you to work harder and work smarter so there was no reduction in output? Or is Absolutely. Or claim that uh, you took a loss in output, but you could explain it better? No, uh, my claim is we worked smarter, surgically, harder, and increased output. And that's, uh, that's we can lay, that narrative is clear. And if that's true, notice that meant that there, prior to that time. And you know, I couldn't guarantee we we're gonna increase output. What we said is we need to, l we need to raise our standard and expectation of performance. We couldn't live by just cutting, 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 not understanding what we're managing and hiding in a corner and hope for a better day. We we're gonna be strategic, we we're gonna be deliberate, and our decisions will be logical and based on data and reasoning. And that approach, uh, even when we couldn't increase output, certainly built the confidence level for the decisions that were to follow down the road. Resignations. <laughs> uh, I didn't mention that part what? either. That, that part helps too. Yeah. Um, I mean, take NYPD. Um, yeah, I mean, precinct commanders just didn't like to be asked questions, and so they put in for retirement <laughs> and went to work for Pinkerton. Um, and I think in most places, the, the guys who were most resistant, you know, with the um, you can't measure what we do, you know, it's really not possible. Um, and they can only get away with that for so long and they begin to get embarrassed and they leave. And so you get, and then, meanwhile you've been watching. That, that produced the culture change inside the organization. What gave you the leverage to cause 40% of your senior managers to leave and not have there be a public floor? Um, I think if things aren't getting worse and beginning to look like they're getting better, I mean, um, you know, if, ah, NYPD, they got rid of the squeegee guys very early, okay? Squeegee guys were a big issue in New York um, and was, were symbolic. You know what a squeegee guy is? This is people How many people? Squeegee guys? Yeah. Oh, if it, I, we can improve part, quality part of life by using them, we would bring them here, but <laughs> we don't have them. Part of, part of it is the, demo, is the geography. Uh, driving out of the Holland Tunnel, you come to a red light, there's no place to go, you're from New Jersey, who are these guys, and uh, you give them money. But, this, is, this is an interesting question about whether the ComSat system could have picked up an answer to that question. Yes, uh, well, yeah, I don't. Whatever, I, will okay. the slide, but I, I mean, I mean I, actually, um, the other, it was very visible. Bratton at one point told me there were only 80 squeegee guys in New York City. There were, everywhere. okay, but they were, you know, and, and it turned out they were also certified bad guys, which means once you arrested them, you could, they had a warrant and you could put them away for a while. Then pretty soon they decided to have another line of business. So if you can have some visible impact relatively quickly and you, um, encourage some people to leave because they find it uncomfortable, and then you find people to replace them. Um, my classic here is a woman um, in Baltimore. She's an immigrant from Nigeria. She starts at the bottom of the sanitation department and keeps getting promoted because they know that's, that she's doing a good job. So the other thing that this does is it gives you a way of understanding who's doing a good job. I mean, I can go to a meeting and not know who the actors are and not really know what the questions are, but I can figure out with the body language and the nature of the questions and the nature of the answers whether somebody's doing a good job or not. So there's also the opportunity for promotion within the system once it's, you're not just taking randomly somebody, you've, you've got some observation about who can do a good job. Uh, if I can add to that, because you, you mentioned about how do you, 40, if you have 40% of resignation or turnover and not have public outcry, w the data is powerful. And what we found, I mean, before we even, I even 
was sworn in. I took, I think, two dozen of my prospective uh, department heads or middle managers who were going to be part of the administration and flew them to Baltimore. I wanted them to experience, I wanted them to sit with department heads and managers and agency heads and understand what the culture was and they heard different stories so they knew what they're getting and I tried to explain, this is what we're heading towards. Now, I've probably, uh, I've had a lot of turnover and department heads and agency heads and, and in the police department I probably pushed out two dozen of the worst cops uh, we ever had and because when you're held accountable to perform, you're either going to do the job and we're going to be relentless about the follow-up about holding ourselves accountable, or you're gonna move on. You can move on. And that happened in some of them, but there's no outcry because there's an expectation that we're gonna do our jobs and there's an expectation we're gonna exceed expectations. So I found the public and my legislative bodies and other uh, colleagues to be very helpful. And I found um, the culture within the organization to be built up when people were working hard, who embraced the approach to, to utilize data to increase performance and efficiency, to unlock innovation, a certain, I, I find a certain segment of that organization lift itself up, and we found other members of you alluded to rank and file, even out of the summer stat to, you know, elevate themselves within the organization to become middle managers, to become department heads. So I think it's strengthened the organization. Very interesting. Uh, let me just try one other quick uh, thing on this. To what extent do you think the political strength of ComStat, uh, which gave was in some sense something <coughs> that everybody who embraced it. Yeah. Improved performance is just down the street. Uh, stay with this; it'll work, right? I mean, that would, to what extent do you think that uh, political appeal was based on a basic idea that, sort of coming from the private sector, that sort of said management 101 is what we need in the public sector, and we've never had it before, and finally we've got it now. There was some of that. Um, there was also, I'd say, with the board of aldermen at the time. And they knew we had to change course. That was clear. We c it could not be business as usual. So that was a great benefit to a new administration coming in. You were, with some importance, yeah. that's a little bankrupt. And, and there was a perception that the private sector certainly does it a lot better you know, than the public sector. There's a, there's a great cartoon caricature of a, of a management course. I saw it in a management course there where in the 50s, mid-century, everybody, whether you're in the public or private sector, was expected to wait in line two or three hours. And as 20, 30 years went forward, in the public sector, we were waiting three or four hours. In the private sector, you were in a matter of minutes. And you understand that, that image. So there was still that image embedded that we, ha we, we just can't sustain. Um, and, so, and it's funny because at the legislative body, I had all the members of the Board of Aldermen 10 years ago saying, now what is Somerset again? I know we're invested in this. It's going <laughs> to change things to campaigning on it now and asking for data, you know, really thinking differently. A culture change has been integrated and embedded at different levels of government and around the community. I, I think externally that's good, yeah. okay? Internally it runs up against the, but you can't measure what we do, right? right? But and what's interesting is that that first one knocks over the second one, apparently. Yeah. Even though there's a reasonable claim on the second side. If, if you can have some visible results, whether it's <coughs> squeegee guys gone or potholes filled or whatever, there's a little table in the book in which um, when they started, um, O'Ma Martin O'Malley in Baltimore's um, most uh, iconic commitment was the 48-hour pothole guarantee. You call 311 um, and we will f and report a pothole and we will fill it within 48 hours. And when it starts off, you know, there's, um, you know, maybe 100 people call a month. And um, a couple years later, 500 people are calling a month. Well, why are they calling? They're calling because they discovered that, that you know, if I call a bottle, they actually fill it. I mean, otherwise, why bother? So there's, you know, those visible things really help, and it's obviously easier at the municipal level where they, what's your phrase? Feel, touch. Touch, feel, and see. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I agree. So to Bob's point, we, we focused on those, <coughs> on those city services where you walked out of your door, you could touch, feel, and see. So fill in potholes. Removing graffiti, uh, trimming trees, uh, your code violations, you moving the squeegee people along off the, off the intersection, and, and, and those are quick results that build credibility and earn trust. So that leads me then to the second question. Um, and uh, the, the second question, I'll maybe give up the third since we've been, uh, but the second question would be is, you say we were flying blind without data, right? But actually, we had a lot of data on had a certain amount of data on com 
compliance with policies and procedures that had been written down in uh, manuals, right? You probably even had some output data from organizations in terms of uh, levels of activity that they were engaged in. And, stuff. Um, and so apparently what got added to this as a guide is something a little bit over the horizon of output data, which could either mean the satisfaction of customers, what they could see, uh, feel, the nature of the encounters they had, or something called social outcomes. So, uh, and it seems to me an interesting question in a lot of these CompStat systems is that insofar as they're focused on managerial accountability, they tend to go at least out to output, but a little bit beyond to client satisfaction and to conditions that we can see immediately, as you just described. But even with those systems, it's a little bit hard to get to outcomes. Uh, now, is that <coughs> uh, true or false, and uh, to what extent uh, does that inhibit the effectiveness of Um, all of us sitting here at the Kennedy School would say filling a pothole is not an outcome. Citizens think it's an outcome. And so there's this uh, dif difference. Ambient conditions. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and so when they, see the out when they see the output, which is the filling of the pothole, you know, we think the out outcome is how smooth the street is and there are measures for okay. that and how and how, how the traffic flows, how long it takes me to get to work and all that stuff. Um, in fact, um, if you do things that people relate to, it gives you that credibility. Yeah, and interesting because one, we would measure, you know, well, we're gonna have so many arrests this year. Is that really a good outcome we want or an output? You know, uh, we wanna have fewer arrests, you know, so. But I think that's part of the evolution of how we think about data. What is really an outcome and an output? What do we really want to measure? What, really want, what do we really want to strive for? And uh, we've evolved that thinking too, you know. Um, I, for instance, we, 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 you know, if, we, if we say, you know, we, we'll, we'll fill so many potholes a year and we'll say we expect to fill 300 potholes, but we really don't want to get the 300 potholes, right? We really have 150. Uh, we want to really tackle the variables that minimize the amount of potholes. So. Your point as well, and the other point I, I do want to agree with, you're right, we actually have, everybody has data at their disposal. And it's how do we want to mine that? And uh, Martin O'Malley, I learned this from Bob, but Martin O'Malley also told me, he says, you know, he, he became mayor, and I did the same thing. He sat in a room with all those agency heads and department heads and said, hey, um, what do you do? <laughs> and, uh, well, I fill <coughs> my fixed streets. Yeah, but, yeah, but what do you do? And you know that, that activity mapping is so critical to understand well, what are the outputs we want to we want to evolve and identify. Some of them we did the same thing. Now I was a member of the legislative body for eight years, and in those departments I just m named off some of them. I couldn't tell you exactly what they did, because it, it, what we were measuring was totally different. It was a, it was a line item number in a budget. So this raises an interesting question about how far down the value chain. good news because if we had to go that far down, we couldn't use it for managerial. Yeah, because it's the feedback loop is too long. So the good news, so maybe then the answer is to improve the measurement of output. Or uh, the, way, the way I would phrase it, which is slightly different, is identify your performance deficits, things that are early in the value chain that affect the outputs and outcomes you want. Um, the best example I have here doesn't come from anybody doing this, but comes from Lowell, Massachusetts, where the school systems, if you know anything about Massachusetts, you can predict that they don't have very good test scores. What did they decide to fix? They decided to fix truancy. Um, kids weren't showing up in school enough, so they mobilized the community, not just the school system. Some people, um, citizen groups, police, probation officers, um, some people were responsible for calling the kids at 6 o'clock in the morning, getting them out of bed, getting them to school. Eventually, truancy rate goes down. With a lag, test scores begin to go up. Can we prove this? Absolutely not. Um, but um, you identify something. We all have a causal theory in our head, having me told you that little story, which is if they aren't in school, they can't learn, or to the extent that they learn, they learn things that we would prefer they not learn. And so um, 
but we can't prove it. Right. So we have a strong advocacy for output pushing. Okay. So last question. Um, that's and and theory about the connections. So the last um, idea was that um, the old bad old days of this stuff was all about accountability and getting people to work hard, as opposed to the good new days where we use data and what you describe as a coded way to learn how to do things better. So the good old new days is when we abandon old practices and shift quickly to uh, new improved practices, and we do that through uh, by using data that we have available. Would either of you be prepared to tell me exactly how that happened? Um, I would actually argue that the first step is to get people to work harder, that they aren't working very hard because nobody's measured you know, simply how many potholes they filled. So we just chug along, oh, gee whiz, you know, it's really hot out today, maybe we'll. Um, so that is the somewhat the first stage, to get them to do what they should start to do. Second stage is getting them to rethink how they do what they're doing. Can we redesign the system for building, filling potholes so that we uh, don't spend half the day driving around the city, but we think about this intelligently? And then we move to what I would call performance stat 3.0, where we figure out should we be filling potholes or should we, you know, what should we be doing differently? Yeah, I, I agree because I, I said at the and when I spoke, one, it is about holding ourselves to be accountable, more accountable. Um, and for the, I think for our, our core, well, I mean, for the public, it's for our core responsibilities. They elect us to do the services they expect. But starting and enabling this collaborative creativity with the utilization of data, one, we we look to be more efficient. We we try to enable more people to be more innovative and creative with the services they're delivering. To think abnormally, as we like to say, uh, and to identify opportunities for programmatic uh, policy improvements or innovation. So outside the basic operational framework, I think Bob just mentioned that more more succinctly. And so it's I think it's all of those mixed in together. You talked a lot of, I never get the chance to talk to you guys this, this way. <laughs> You've got big data as a potential useful, and there's data all around, a lot of it being spewed out, a lot of it underutilized. We've got this problem of collecting some portion of that for regular routine observation and performance stat. But then we've got that whole sea of data that we could use to explore, to find ways to improve our performance, either within an existing set of products or adding new products or new different kinds of interventions to make, right? And at that point, the analyst looms into view as the person who is invited into that sea of data to figure out where improvements could be made. Is that, is that yeah, a that's a fair statement. Okay. So then the interesting question is, is where do those analysts and their uh, <coughs> innovation agenda fit into the Comstat framework? Um, rephrase that question slightly so I just know what I, I got multiple answers I can give. Yeah, no, I'm sure you do. Um, so where does this happen? And what's the and where learning is mm -hmm. the learning about improving improving processes for existing products, but also reimagining the set of products so that we could get better results measured in outcome terms or deal with problems we hadn't seen previously. And you've got a group of people working with unstandardized data mm -hmm. trying to work out answers to that question. So how do you make that happen? I, I would argue that, first of all, your analysts can be imaginative, but I also think it happens at the meetings. Okay, the meetings are problem-solving meetings. They are, what happens, what would we, what would happen if we did this? Well, and you know, well, you know, that would cost us here, but it would do it there. Um, smart agency heads walk into the room with say, saying, okay, here's where we can go to the next level, but this is what we need from you. Okay, it might be money, but it might be no money, but flexibility to reallocate people. Um, and one of the things that often are in the room are people who can say yes or no, or we have to, f we have to figure this out. So we don't have to run another meeting to examine this, okay? Maybe the lawyers have to be there so that the lawyers can tell you what you can do and what you can't do. Um, or the budget guy has to be there. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It happens. That's why I consider enabling collaborative creativity. Right. Uh, and we want to charge people to bring and have that free conversation to bring ideas. One, we want to be 
freeing our conversation and being probative of the data that's before us and asking why, why, why are we, why is this, what is the data saying? Are we all interpreting the same way? I had a meeting this morning and we're on a basic, very basic service on sidewalk panel repairs and understanding, you know, in the last few years, uh, my crews can only attack or, s or respond to a third of the, re of the 900 requests. And we're getting a backlog. You know, someone has to do a new ADA requirements and so forth. And, you know, and, and under what circumstances can we optimally address all of it with in-house personnel? Should we, use p should we contract out? Were there some legal impediments? And that was a very robust and somewhat heated conversation, but very robust and constructive where ideas were flowing from the Public Works Department, from the Law Department, from the analysts, and uh, what I can tell, all the great ideas for myself. And to we understand, we didn't, I don't think we had a solution yet today, but we had an idea of, look, uh, this is where we need to think about, hard and strong about. I would agree, and I think a great example of that is in our, in our police department. Um, I have, I, we bring statting now down to the neighborhood level. From here I get to go to a Resistat meeting where we'll share data uh, with the public and think about policy and operations and how they collide and <coughs> systems. Our police department, I, and finally you go to a Resistat meeting, I don't have a cop or a commander standing up saying, well if you give us more officers and we'll reduce crime. That doesn't work that way. But understanding how policy and approach to systems uh, collide with operational effectiveness of community-based policing and so forth. That narrative has changed with the utilization of deaths. You're right. That has to be part of it, a part and parcel. We cannot separate the two. Very, very, very exciting because I think the weakness of the policy development piece was that it never got operational. And the weakness yeah, and they were separated off. They were separated and you couldn't connect them and the operational piece never had quite enough dynamism in it. So somehow or other getting those two together feels like a work in advance. I'm finished. Um, has anybody got any uh, other uh, burning questions? Yes, sir. Well, this isn't quite, well, I, this is a burning question, actually, literally. It doesn't have to be burning. But, <laughs> and uh, I don't know if it's because I'm a better wise guy or because I have so much respect for our speakers that I'm trying to think of the most difficult problem to throw at them that I can. Give it a ball. <laughs> well, it's for both of you, Mary Jo. Uh, uh, we know that... Uh, the government agency in the United States at the present time that has the greatest problem with winning the trust of the constituents is the Ferguson Police Department. And so uh, are there specific ideas that you might have if the Ferguson Police Chief, of course I suppose the problem is the Ferguson Police Chief is under the, I don't know whose authority he's under, uh, but if whoever person whose authority is under calls up you guys, would you have any good ideas for him along data lines? I think the resignation su uh, suggestion would be the first one. <laughs> I, I thought, uh, let me just say this about the Ferguson piece. Let me say this about the Ferguson If anyone thinks that it's a strictly policing issue or operational issue, they're never going to tackle that problem. Um, you without measuring the social impacts of policy and how they collide and how that relates to policing and the outcomes you wish we uh, society wishes to achieve in terms of crime prevention they will never get there and uh, we didn't have a ferguson issue in some of but in some of the police department 10 years ago they would say on the side of the car instead of to protect and to serve you had to print on it what about me and the officers would not get out of the cars they did not reflect the community uh, they would only react to crimes and and really, it, it, but the, the improvement in what is now a model department hasn't been only about hiring more offices or switching to some operational efficiency. It's understanding how policy, whether it's, it, whether it's economic, social, health, or policing policy collides with basial, uh, you know, community-based policing and operational effectiveness. Um, I, I, I think one, you need, it has to be house cleaning, 
in a whole new leadership regime there. There are so many inherent problems in the makeup of that department, and uh, I certainly think if they took an approach to you know statting, not just comp statting, not just the measure and arrests, but understanding how the environments we create in our neighborhoods, in our schools, based on the policies we set and how we measure that, collide to create or to influence behavior has resulted in what you see out there. That's not a mistake. That is a direct result of a collision of either field systems or policies of those, or, or those systems and policies that do not exist. Um, I, my comment would simply be, I, every once in a while, just like you, I get calls from journalists and they want me to pontificate about something I know nothing about. And I tell them, I know nothing about this. And you know, I mean, basically, they've, they've written a story and they, got, they want the quote from some academic on paragraph two and I'm not going to give it to them. If I wanted to know what I was going to do there, I'd go there. And I'd have to spend a lot of time before I understood what was going on. Yes, so that's I true. Have, which I spent, you know, 20 years of my life thinking about the management of police departments and stuff like that. But let me put it in this context for a minute. Because <coughs> you could imagine that the Ferguson, <coughs> at least in part, leaving aside all the important points that have been made about uh, community relationships and stuff like that, faces what you could call a high reliability performance task, right? That is, the ability to uh, make an arrest in dangerous circumstances without shooting a Now, that's equivalent to, you know, medical errors. It's equivalent to, uh, you know, not uh, the, uh, the... Airplane landing. Yeah, airplane landing. So there's, so, and there's a whole literature in organizations about the construction of organizations. Uh, they take child protective services, too. I mean, the thing about child protective services and policing is that they do work, and on average, that work goes well. And even when they're doing the best job using the best methods and stuff like that, bad stuff happens, right? And so then the problem comes to distinguish between conscientious errors that are tragedies, right, uh, versus uh, recklessness versus evil, right? And that's part of the judgment that has to be made here. But the, the managerial challenge, and this is the interesting thing about its relationship to Comstock and stuff, is do, what do we know about the management of high reliability organizations where very small errors and infrequent events turn out to that, it seems to me, is a whole different kind of managerial accountability environment in which to operate um, uh, that, uh, you know, Comstat might have something to say about it. But Deming and his work have a lot more to say about it. Uh, so, you know, we've got a lot of hands in the air. Uh, yes, sir. You came in late. We already asked for a poll of who had seen it. And we already catalogued. It got good ratings. <laughs> Um, first, the first comment I would make is the um, famous Donald Campbell law. If you're going to be collecting data and you're going to be using that in some way that rewards or punishes people, don't be surprised when they fake it. So auditors are useful if it's a danger. Uh, second is what is it you're trying to accomplish and if you can't measure it directly what is the best thing you can measure. Um, the, um, the phrase in the educational testing business is uh, the challenge of educational testing is designing a test worth teaching to. Because what do you think teachers are going to do? Shocking that they would actually, if you evaluate them on how well their kids do on the test, let me see, they're human, what will they do? They will teach to the test. 
So you've got to figure out what it is you want to test them on and then how you are going to make sure that what they are doing reflects something close to what your reality is. I, just so you know, there is no perfect performance measure. You give me a measure, I can tell you what's wrong with it. Okay, so it's not like, oh, we got the wrong measures. It's, no, we, do we have the best measures we can and can we watch out how well we are doing given the problems that we can predict will happen? Uh, if I can add to that, uh, that's becoming, I would say, the way you're describing it is how you, people s static with the statistics. And really, they're, being, they're not being probative about, and by the way, the TV and reality are two different things. Let's get the wire. But, uh, you know, let's take your, your example on teaching to the test. So the MCAS system, which is the Comprehensive Assessment System in Massachusetts, you know, for years in some of we like, we're not performing well, we're poor on MCAS scores. The next year we'll go by another test. We're not performing well, we're poor on MCAS scores. The next year we'll go by, performed a little better, we're still below everybody else. Nobody's asking why. Why? What is dry, what are the variables driving that outcome? What are the, what are, what are the social impacts of what we're doing in our neighborhoods? Are kids eating three <coughs> meals a day? Are they eating healthy? Are they truant? Are they, like they thought about in Lowell? Are we measuring everything we should be measuring? They've got a snapshot of one output Oh, one data source, and that's the test. And no one's measuring that real time. They take the test, come back next year, they take it again, and every year they complain that the schools aren't getting better. But nobody's measuring the systems-based, using a systems-based approach, what is occurring in our neighborhoods, our communities, in our classrooms, how we're teaching. So they're really, I think they're driving a car blindfolded. Uh, and, and that's why, and as a default, we're teaching to the test. And, that's a, and, and we're, we're not a learning organization when we're doing that, as Bob's alluding to. We're, we're defaulting to just teaching the test, and if you don't meet that standard, well, we'll hold you accountable. Notice quickly that Bob's answer, design a test that is worth teaching to, is an example of an improvement in an output measurement. Right? Uh, so there's... there's uh, yeah. Anyway. So, um, yes, back here. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question was, uh, you made some reference to the private sector, and... and <coughs> said that they get a better job, you know, measuring stuff. Of course, I mean, they're measuring <coughs> income, you know, uh, and profits. So I can see how in the public sector you, you can manage to measure uh, how, you, how you were doing today compared to how you were doing yesterday or today or the week before. But how do you compare between different departments? Like, how do you, how do you, how do you know if the health department is doing a better job than the environmental department? Than doing a better job than the security department. Is there is there any way that you can actually? Uh, because this is an important question. Because then you have, you can decide how you you uh, allocate your budget uh, on, on the, regarding on the main sector. So I think nobody would disagree that the private sector advanced faster than the public sector in terms of management. But let's be clear. I know I can point to a lot of private sector inefficiencies. I have a friend of mine who runs a an industry, and I, won't, I don't want to give it away, so of its kind, he's one of the largest in the U.S., he has 56 locations, and I asked him, how does he measure the, you know, the customer service response to a customer request or a service level? He says, I really don't. Um, and, you know, how do you measure, you know, satisfaction? Well, we really don't, but he has great ads, and people love him, and, and he makes a lot of money. So, but, so there's plenty of examples where that, but, you know, it's terms of how, how we think about customer services and delivery service certainly evolve faster in the and the private, and because for many reasons, and then the public sector. Well, there are core things we do in each department. We can benchmark against each other how quick we respond to common issues from customers. Um, you know, um, there are certain services that are unique to different departments, but I think if we can't measure interdepartmentally, how we benchmark that against other communities. One of the things some of us was a leader when was on the StatNet New England organization. So we tried to mentor and work with other cities around New England. So whether they be Nashua, New Hampshire, or, or Springfield, Mass at the time, which got rid of statting, by the way, Bob, um, or, or Amesbury, or large and small cities, you know, we'll try to benchmark, well, how are we delivering sanitation services? You know, um, and what are the outputs we're measuring, and how do we compare with each other, or how are we filling potholes, or how are we procuring a particular supply to a particular department, and that's been very uh, beneficial in having that cross-collaboration. So it doesn't have to be interdepartmentally, though there are some particular core things we do within the city that we can measure against each other. Um, but again, most of our services are unique to that particular agency. 
but notice you can't compare the engineering department within a firm with the marketing department right. with the manufacturing department, okay? I mean, the, the example you gave doesn't hold up in the private sector. One other quick response to that is the government may be lousy at allocating across areas, but it might be really good at improving its performance in each of the areas. Mm -hmm. And we could say that our goal is productivity, the value we're after is productivity gains, not improved value through improved resource allocation. And then a lot of the value would pop right out of the performance measurement system. Sorry, you already want to come? Yeah. So I, I'm a big fan of both of your work, and it's nice to see you together here, uh, theory and practice. Um, whatever we've thought about performance staff um, is that there's an interesting tension between building an accountability structure for performance in a particular department, and then breaking down that accountability structure again to work across silos. Right. So first you construct a performance accountability system for, let's say, fire departments, police departments, uh, child <coughs> services. Uh, and then you find out that, you know, as you said, Mayor, uh, policies collide in reality. And then every silo has to rethink what it's doing that affects the other silo. So there's this tension. And, and so uh, I was wondering if, you know, when you look at all the stat systems that you've seen, what do the systems that are best at kind of managing that tension, what do they have in common? Good managers. Okay, I mean, I just say it louder. Smart, good managers, smart people. People who ha can go from, um, you know, we were talking before about getting them to work harder, then getting them to work smarter in terms of redesigning the current systems and then figuring out how we, how we work together to get at the real purpose we have underlying it. I don't think you can jump to the top of the performance mountain, no, without, first of all, just getting people to, how many potholes did you fill this week? And uh, this crew filled uh, 50 potholes last week and your crew filled 10. Well, we had bigger potholes, okay, or whatever it was. But, you know, that begins to break down, and you begin to figure out who can do it. And then, okay, how do, once, once we do that, how do we re redesign it? And then eventually you can get people working together about bigger problems, yes. I, I found, you know, in that setting, from a, from a practice and standpoint, again, enabling collaborative creativity has helped to break down those silos. But you have to have good people at the end of the day. I've moved... I moved a lot of people along. If it's not working out, then we, then we, 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 you know, we just have to make that decision. We have to move people along. Uh, when you say good, what are some of the characteristics? I want. Smart or is, is there uh, any other no, I have, I've had a lot of smart people. I charge. I seriously say this to people. You have one thing I ask you to be is that's to be abnormal, be uncommon, be abnormal, and have a passion for curiosity. You give me anyone. I don't care what they're. If they have basic educational background, you know, and, and I have people in department heads that are running departments, that wasn't their lifelong dream. I, people who do innovative stuff in traffic and parking, actually Harvard took one of them here, and the most he knew about it, he got about 20 tickets around, I know when he was growing up as a kid. But he had, he had a passion for curiosity, he was in the financial <coughs> sector, and uh, he was trying to be abnormal, innovative, and really carved a niche for himself. But, you know, that type of approach, you know, and I've actually tried to take a lot of my analysts and summer staff people and, and try to force them to go into other departments. And uh, that's been really huge for us. I, I think the meetings are really evaluative. Okay, you can figure out pretty well who's trying, who's got some good ideas. Um, Matt Gallagher, who um, was director of city stat in Baltimore and then director of state stat in, in Maryland said, uh, the meetings separate the pretenders from the contenders. Yeah. It's really. If someone's yeah. silent, they stick out. If you're silent, you really, it's very loud. Just going back to this meeting one more time, um, notice there's a difference between uh, getting good at uh, better and better at a standard job and then discovering that we have a joint problem together yeah. that we have to figure out the solution for and then execute it and then learn from the experiment. Yeah. But that's on a different cycle time yes. in some sense than the routine management of uh, people's operations, right? And you can imagine that analysts might play an important lead role in the nomination of a problem that was being neglected and in sorting it out. But again, to then get action taken 
you have to construct a structure, a new structure of accountability around the group that has just discovered that they have this in common. Yeah. And that's where the follow-up comes from on the new project. But it's now a new performance measurement system that's attached to that project, not the old one. Right? That's true. And, and in what we did in Somerset, right after that, we'd had, we have every live task list. Because it wasn't just, well, the mayor's going to make this phone call to someone. It was about... You know, what are the opportunities for collaboration, for instance, to come in? How do we follow up on that discussion? You know, I had two meetings today, and uh, the first one was very interesting and frustrating at times, and, uh, and people still trying to internalize all the solutions that had to come from them. Well, it could come from the group. And uh, then I had a new person who took over my... Like the Harvard faculty. Yeah, I mean, I, you should start over here, though, by the way. <laughs> I just said that. And the, then the new head of recreation came in, and she came into this meeting, our first staff meeting, was talking about all the issues, identified different issues, and engaged the analysts and talked about the different departments she wanted to follow up with about possible opportunities and solutions with. So, you know, we want to encourage that and enable that conversation. You know, but it was two different dynamics played back to back. You know, the latter was pretty impressive. The former one was a little frustrating. Didn't you have a version of problem stat, Bob? I know you went from uh, performance stat to jurisdiction yeah. stat, and I yeah. like the idea of a problem stat. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of the meetings are. They're, they're focused on a specific problem, okay? But it cuts across areas. But yes, but it, 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 does, it does lots of things, okay? It um, gets us moving to the next level. It gets new people engaged. It helps us learn what our, the capacity of our organization is, who we give next, worth of, next level of assignments to. Great. Okay, come on. Uh, you had, oh, the guy left. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, there are many different uh, programs that came out of this uh, performance stat concept. Why don't you mention them for, for the next day? It's called Border Stat in San Diego. It was uh, an yeah. attempt by the uh, Border Patrol to uh, interdict uh, illegal immigrants. But at the same time, you have cities like Somerville are doing everything they can to frustrate the uh, implementation of the federal immigration laws. So these we call that open door stat. Um, we've never had agencies in the U.S. federal system working at cross purposes before. No, but the different levels of government. Oh no, no, I don't think that's an unusual thing. He, he's saying that this is the price of federalism, <laughs> right? Uh, so, would you like to comment on that, Mayor Curtis Tone? Would you like to explain the virtues of federalism? <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, <laughs> Nothing happens in Washington. Sometimes it happens at the states, but at the local and regional level, you're getting results. The best way I can tell you. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Yeah, in one of Bob's earlier books, he talks about the concept of 360 degree accountability. That image I find really useful because it introduces citizens and civic groups into the mix of stakeholders across the line, across which that becomes really useful. Okay, so, in terms of some of those. What street? <laughs> <laughs> just curious. It's near Beacon Street where they are digging up the thing. I talked to the guy the other day and I said, when is the fracking going to be over? Absolutely. So tonight, from here, at 6.30, in your ward, you can come to the Argenziano School for the Ward 2 Resistat meeting. And we're going to throw all kinds of data at you. We're going to talk about public safety data. We're going to talk about housing data. We're going to talk about a host of data and charge you and have an exercise with you, even rodent data, rat information, rat stat. Uh, and uh, see if you see the data as you view it in the same way we do. And we're going to charge you to push us for more data. So if residents are engaged, Engage to help us on the, in, in the operational effectiveness of our of our of our of our programs. Residents have engaged with the utilization data to outlining a the city's first ever comprehensive plan called Summer Vision in terms of certain outcomes and goals we want for the community over 20 years. No, 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 I'm not. No, I want you to come tonight. <laughs> He's taking attendance. No, no, I'm not. I'm serious. I agree. I appreciate that, and I hope you have you ever been to a resident staff meeting. Bob has. Well, yeah, I'm just saying we are. I, I have no, no, we are. We are we're in, I only. It was kind of funny because we're in your ward tonight. Love to have you come by. 
Uh, no, but we, we, our, our goal is to try to push the data down to the grassroots level, into the neighborhood level. The greatest conduit of information will be you. Um, do you, the things you touch, feel, and see, are you, do you see, do you interpret the data the same way we do? And we hope you're going to push back and be probative and ask us why. Uh, I was at a meeting last night, and I had, I was challenged by a couple of residents about really the effectiveness of um, inspectional services on some problem properties in the neighborhood. And it was interesting to hear their concerns and then to find out that they're, they're really not feeding us the information to our 311 constituent call center. So that dialogue was Vi uh, it was robust and it was very constructive. But uh, no, I agree with what you're saying, and we are seeking new ways to push that data down into your hands to be involved. But really, if you have a chance, come by tonight. You wouldn't want that lovely local process to be overridden by a federal Comstat, would you? <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. You really want to know? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> we are the Brooklyn of Boston. You mean <laughs> Somerville, <laughs> not Cambridge, right? Somerville, yeah. The timeline has been 11 years and counting. It continues to evolve and change from uh, how extensive and what we measure um, to how long our stat meetings are. Now we speed stat, like speed dating. We're 30 minutes in and out. It's been interesting. We've been measuring even that performance. Um, so, you know, I think coming in, and Bob has written about this, you know, uh, yeah, you might, you'll face some cultural hurdles. People want to know, well, what do you want to know why I do? Uh, why do you want to know what I do? And you know, you're gonna look over my shoulder. Well, yeah, I'm the mayor. I kind of want to know what you're doing. But uh, you know, but what I think what what sold the value statement that really got people and and we focused in public works and a couple other departments at the beginning was, I think they actually appreciated the fact that we wanted to map their activities that we didn't understand fully their work uh, outputs and, and the amount that goes into any particular service to deliver in the city. In that, you know, they gained appreciation over time that if they if they, they could advocate for more resources to increase outputs or, or services to the citizens. So if, I, if we invest in certain capital equipment or over time, we can, we can deliver this service better for the community. So I think it was, a, it was just a tenacious and persistent reinforcement that this is a value that delivering high performance or the measuring performance was a benefit not just to the public or the organization but to every member of the organization whether you're a union or non-union management um and you know i think they bought bought into that over time some anxiety at the beginning and with the unions you know i mean the data doesn't lie in our negotiations with the unions uh, we go well, we also when we go in front, of, in, some, in front of certain labor management boards in Boston, you know, you know what our outputs are, you know what the cost, the activity-based cost of a particular service is. It's certainly helpful, but it is a cultural change. Uh, someone used the analogy or a metaphor of, um, you know, turning an aircraft carrier around. It it, turn, it turns slowly. It's not on a dime. Uh, but when we came in, I think we had the benefit of an unfortunate fiscal crisis. And everyone understand that we had to change business, not just policy makers, but those who work in the city. Uh, we weren't investing in their equipment or departments either. We weren't hiring manpower. We weren't invest investing in their well-being. So over time, Bob talks about results. Well, we showed results not just in the services we're delivering, but in the services we're delivering to our employees. Better equipment, better training, uh, a better performance as a community, our financial standing improved, better pay, better wages. It just, it, you know, it increases incrementally and exponentially over time. So there's been a lot of talk about drilling down into very specific measures and talk about going across. I'm curious about the temptation or utility of rolling up, and to the extent at which you 
can't compare across departments, but to get to a point where maybe there's not a single number, but there's some way that you can index all of the sum of all of the activities in the city to sort of see, you know, macro level right track, wrong track kind of a thing. So is that something that scares you? That's something you're trying to do? Is that, or is there no utility in exercise like that? Uh, I think there is utility in exercise like that. We, I, and I may, hope I'm answering your question. So. Uh, one of the things we're going to measure is really the social progress of the community. You've all heard of a social progress index and in that we measured happiness of the community. Why would we do that? And why, do we, why are we building a well-being index for the city? Do our policies, our performance, our operations impact, can we impact your sense of happiness or well-being and how you feel about the city? So community? Will that impact you staying here, raising your family here? So I hope I'm answering that. So we're rolling up to the more at a 30,000 foot level of what we're thinking about. I guess my question is, could we ever get to a point where you say Somerville is at seven? You know, seven out of ten. New York or, City is at 12. Or, 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 or you, know, for, you know, not even just compare across. But just yep. Show. In some measurements, yeah. Um, I, I would just argue that at some point that there's also policy decisions that get made in terms of comparisons. Um, I've lived in a lot of different places and had my trash picked up in a lot of different ways. And so comparing just the simple trash across multiple jurisdictions isn't just how efficient the trash department is or the contractor is, but do we pick it up twice a week or do we pick it up once a week? Do we pick it up at the curb? Do we pick it up in the backyard? Do you do, does the city... What? Do you charge a price or not? Yeah. Does, does, does the city provide the container or, or not? I mean, um, so it's, that's not oper just operational. There's a policy choice that gets made, which we make compared to what else do we, do we want to invest in? Do we want to invest more in schools? Do we want to invest more in fire services? Those are policy choices that mean that your index across policy choices reflects what the policy choices were, and you may say, they made the wrong policy choice, to which the citizens say, who the hell are you? So one, indexing is often related to monetization as well, and the same, <coughs> same aspiration drives both of them to get a summation across and observed over time. And the question, I think, with respect to both of those questions is always whether you're gaining or losing information that would benefit the citizens in terms of what's happening in your city, right? Uh, and so if you construct a distorted measure, then it doesn't help the citizens very much. So you, uh, but if, uh, so how far the citizens want to go in terms of understanding the concrete detail versus the summary uh, is, I think, an important uh, question that links, actually, this ac apparently technical activity of uh, performance stat to the political activity of consultation with the community about what turns out to be important. Um, Let's see, let me just, uh, um, she's had her hand up for a while, Jane, and then I'll go to you, so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask you about the politics of the performance set. And Good. perhaps, Joe, you could speak from your position of perspective, and, you know, Bob, you can talk about from, and, you know, observation analyst perspective. Um, so there must be really three systems that you have encountered when people feel like, you know, you watch out with my back and I'm losing something or losing a certain kind of security because performance is now speaking out loud about so Where you 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 is is a uh, employee, right? A citizen citizen employee or a citizen? Well, um, as an employee, okay. Now your performance is out there, and everyone yep, yep, sir. Yep. criticize it, or you have, there's a backlog of things that haven't been done, so you create expectations for citizens that they think, oh, now I know how much you haven't done. So how do you deal with the politics? And you know, I think there's some in some cities maybe there's a strong mayor system, such as in Somerville. Um, there might be certain ways in which you implement it in, in a much easier way than if you go to a city where there's no strong mayor system. Uh, so how do you kind of broaden the practice of performance that not just in strong mayor city, but also in other places where there will be a lot of local resistance? And I guess, you know, a point of view from as a student of public policy here is how should we think about this? Like if I, you know, I'm not going to become a mayor next year when I graduate or whatnot, but I want to be able to think about how do we bring this to practice, you know, as an employee or as a citizen to push that kind of um, I, th I think the, the key question is, is this person who you just identified, 
capable of calling a meeting and essentially mandating people to show up. And if this person can, they can do this, okay? Independent, strong mayor, weak mayor. Um, we have this image that uh, the mayor of Chicago is a um, strong mayor and the mayor of New York is a weak mayor. Actually, uh, constitutionally, it's the other way around. Uh, so be a little bit careful about what you mean by strong, strong and weak. Um, and then the ability to make, uh, but to, if you can get people in the room and drive a discussion about what we need to fix next, you can do this. No, I, I agree. I mean, I found, I mean, surely, I, I will tell you that, you know, as a, I'm strong mayor, let's say, you know, I, some of all Boston, same form of government, Cambridge, several more than your city manager. So, you know, it is, I have greater flexibility to do this. I need to do it. There's still checks and balances. You know, but it's not impossible for us. You know, City of Lowell, um, a few years ago, you know, we worked with them and the city manager. It was not to, it was not to battle with the city council, but was able to get staff and uh, start a staff program. There were many small towns, even with a strong mayor. Town of Amesbury, you know, is basically a town with a city form of government. You know, the mayor, you know, basically his own stat department. Uh, but there's no reason why any agency can't be part of the authority of public meeting. Last question, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Oh, great, because I'd like to um, build on your question and take this out of a high income country and put it in a low income country to focus on the key <coughs> elements of performance stat as a leadership strategy. Because two things you have not said it doesn't have to be expensive in terms of financial costs, it doesn't have to be high tech. And so my question is, taking the core elements of the leadership strategy, is there any reason why it cannot be adapted to a low-income environment? Um, no, but I would make it just a slightly different distinction, which is, have you got the corruption problem under control? And if you don't, you can't delegate responsibility and say, here's your target, go, f go achieve it, and people just hire their cousins and give the contracts to their friends. So you have to, at some level, have figured out that you have enough control over, the, not that we have it here in Massachusetts, but, um, in, but you have enough of it so that you um, can ensure that you just aren't giving away the store. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, I, I remember even talking to mayor, you know, four countries, but Florida and communities, I mean, or, or smaller towns, this isn't a fancy computer, computer program. It's not about technology. It's just about basically Microsoft spreadsheet. You put your numbers on there. <laughs> there you go. Well, what do you do? And that's the first question. And you get and you put your approach. You do, however, need to build up that analytical capacity. That is critical. Uh, and I think Chuck Ford, right, developed that ability to, you know, crunch in the numbers. Yeah, sure. Just an abstract set of numbers in the day. But you know, we can still be probative. We can still ask questions. We can still be abnormal about what we're thinking. But Building up that analytical capacity would be the greatest investment anyone can do. Hey, we'll take one last question because you've been uh, patient, but this will be the last, and uh, then I have an announcement. Yeah, I'm from France, and uh, I used to be here for five years at Fellow. Uh, uh, and uh, even in France, we have heard about the mayor of Somerville. So <laughs> <laughs> I've never been invited. It's funny. <laughs> 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 and uh, my question is, is the following. Uh, Mayor, do you think about the possibility for you to relocate? Because, uh, I France will, would I will, be a possibility. I will, <laughs> I will be very happy to give you a list of uh, huh. tens of thousands of uh, towns or cities who will in France badly need your leadership. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for that. Um, we should thank both our guests very strongly uh, for, uh, yeah, Bob, you want to I, want, I would just want to make one comment about um, the uh, leadership aspect of this and the ability to delegate. Um, Joe said, um, I was, and I didn't prompt him to say this today, 
But I end the section on who runs the meeting with the following. As Joseph Curtitoni, mayor of Somerville, has often said of public settings, my director of Somerstat speaks for me. Did it again today. And that's a very important, is if he's willing to delegate, then um, you're going to get leadership throughout the organization. So I'd like to thank both our panelists. Um, buy the book, uh, learn about the experiences and accomplishments of Mayor Curtis Tony, and go out and create good and just society. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.